It's my pleasure to have you here with us today for what will be our final program in a series that uh, has been our 2010 public policy series. Um, your Chamber of Commerce is focused on three things, information, services, and adv advocacy. Uh, this public policy series encompasses all three of these points, and this is the seventh one that we have had this year. Um, we're pleased today to have with us uh, our, our uh, chairman-elect of our Board of Commissioners, Bernie Huntstead. Um, I want to thank uh, AT&T, in particular Mr. Dave Weller, for, um, for, for doing such a fabulous job in support of not only your chamber, but it, particularly in support of this program. Um, to, to, to say that Dave is a marvelous representative for AT&T would be the understatement of the day. Um, he's a great corporate citizen. He's a great believer in public service. And I'm pleased to, to, to call him a friend. So with that, I want to introduce Mr. Dave Willer, a 35-year veteran of AT&T. Thank you, Mike. What an introduction. I wish I knew that guy. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I always appreciate it. Good friend. I have, you didn't come to hear me speak, but I do want to say just to thank you for your attendance at these uh, public policy series luncheons this year. Uh, we hope that it's been a good contribution. We get positive feedback. We appreciate being a part of that and a partner with the Chamber of Commerce to help present this. So thanks to Mike and Paula and Trina and everyone else that helps make these happen. I get the distinct pleasure to introduce someone that I've known for less than an hour. <laughs> but I've learned a lot about Bernie Hunstead in the last hour, the mayor elect of Danville. You have uh, on your program, there's a list uh, which uh, says that he is a Danville native, a 1969 graduate of Danville High School. Uh, Bernie and I graduated from high school in the same year, not the same school, but the same year. Uh, so I have a pretty good idea how old Bernie and I are. Um, he returned to Danville after 30 years of service, and it lists all the medals, and I couldn't pronounce them all, so I, I asked Bernie if he would give me some other information, so he was kind enough to do that. And, and he has an incredible international background, uh, his time in the service. Before that, he worked for Fruit of the Loom. He was a senior cost accountant and analyst, and then he went into the military. And in the military, he had all kinds of interesting assignments, including Assistant Inspector General of the Army Reserve Command in Atlanta, uh, Defense Advisor of U.S. Mission to NATO in Belgium. Uh, he he uh, has been an observer of uh, civilian military exercises in Russia. Uh, he has had a special assignment to Turkey for military to civilian assistance. Spent 18 months as a civilian contractor in Iraq and three years active duty in Europe, among all the other medals and other honors that you've seen. He is truly an accomplished person. Based on my conversation, the short time I've been able to know him, I am confident that he is going to do a terrific job as your mayor. Would you please welcome the mayor-elect of Danville, Kentucky, your Danville, Kentucky, Bernie Huntsman. Bernie. I was asked to talk about uh, my vision for Danville 
and it kind of reminded me of a, a story that I heard many years ago. And I'm wondering how many of you in this group uh, remember the beatniks? Yeah. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Well, they were a little different. They usually had the, I guess they were the predecessors to uh, the hippies. But uh, there's a story of a man that was, uh, he was driving and he picked up a hitchhiker. And the hitchhiker had to be a beatnik. And so uh, he was an average guy with the passenger, and uh, he was having a little difficulty uh, talking to him. And he comes to a junction in a road, and it's a fork. And so he has to stop, and he can't see the road behind him. So he asks the beatnik, is there anything coming? And the beatnik says, nothing but a pup, man, nothing but a pup. So he pulls out, and wham! He's immediately run over, and the next thing he knows, he wakes up and he's in the hospital. And he looks over to the side, and the beatnik is over there. And so he asked him, he said, uh, what happened? I thought you said there was nothing but a pup coming. Yeah, man, a greyhound, a greyhound. <laughs> so I'm asked to talk about vision, and uh, what I want to point out is that that's probably one of the most difficult things to do because uh, we all have slightly different meanings and we have different backgrounds and uh, it would be wonderful if we all, even though we all think we speak the same <coughs> in, in reality because uh, our values and cultures are a little bit diverse that sometimes they don't come out the same. So I would just ask that you kind of keep that in mind. I'd like to talk about a community for a minute and, and ask you what a community means to you. Uh, I'm going to be giving a vision here in a moment about our community. And I want to suggest, uh, first of all, I guess everybody will recognize that we all live together. Anybody from out of town? So we're all in the same <laughs> geographical area, so that's part of being in the community. Uh, another part of the community is that we are, we are all under the same laws. Now, do you think that, is everyone in this room, are we all covered by the same laws? Anybody live in the county versus the city? Okay, in the county, do you think do you have some, perhaps some different laws? <coughs> Communities all share a common interest. Do we all share the same common interest? I think you can see as we go, as you continue down this line, you'll see that there's a divergence. divergence. And then, of course, the last thing, that was my story about the Greyhound, is we have a little bit different values, mores, customs, culture. I like to coin a phrase and talk about, uh, and start thinking about a community in motion. I used that term a couple of times during the campaign, but I was hesitant to use it because I didn't want it to be an idea that's so hard to grasp and understand that it might derail the election message. But I'm going to use that more and more as I uh, continue in office as your mayor. Because when I look at the vision of Danville, what I hope to instill and influence is that we become a community in motion. And I'll, I'll cover and talk about some things and perhaps you can start to see uh, some of the ideas that, that are going to come out of this. Because motion, it's not just about <coughs> transportation in this sense when we're talking about a community. And certainly our transportation system is important there. But it's also, uh, think about our career paths. You know, our careers are not stagnant, are they? Shouldn't be. And what about our government? Is our government stagnant? Shouldn't be. Should be a government in motion. Should always be anticipating the future and as changes come, be flexible and have the security and the strength and the flexibility to adapt and to uh, do well. And the reason I'm presenting this way is because today as never before, if we look at just Danville, 
will probably come up short. We need to start thinking as a community on a regional and an even international basis. If you drive out Lebanon Road, how many of those factories and sheet metal buildings carry American names now? In fact, is there one out there? Somebody help me. American names. American names. Now, how about international names? Daniel. 3B. 3B. So, um, when we look at our community, we have to think on an international basis. I was talking to Dave, and we, we had a discussion about the call centers. How they first went offshore, now they've come back. I guess Louisville is the closest major call center now for us. That's right. So that's kind of the idea about the flexibility and looking, looking uh, towards the future. And let's talk about our government and the things that uh, will help us as we become a community in motion. And the first one I'd like to mention would be transparency. You know, do we? We just came through an election, and in both uh, on the local, the state, the national level, this was a, an election to behold. And uh, historically, uh, everyone uh, would have to agree with you when, you when they look at this election historically, uh, it's going to be discussed for a long time, and uh, we're also, everybody's anticipating big changes. There obviously was a lot of dissatisfaction up and down the line. It wasn't just our local area, it wasn't just the state, but it was also national. I think what drives a lot of the dissatisfaction is that uh, when people do not understand or they don't know what's going on, in many cases, you know, their government could have been pursuing a perfectly good course of action, but if the people didn't know about it or if they had the wrong information about it, uh, that could be a problem. And I think, without going into too much detail, we could, if you thought about it, you could probably see some of that even in a local election. <clears throat> some of the things that I would like to see happen with our own local government would be uh, perhaps take a look at a decision model that could be incorporated into the city so that citizens would have the ability to look in to see what's going on and to see watch the process of a decision being made so that when the results come out in the paper or in a course of action they'll better understand why that decision was made and I know if you come to the City Commission Board I know many times I mean Paul is here and he's done a perfectly good job and he's come up with a decision but he might have some angry people out front and they may not understand why uh, he arrived at that decision. So we need to be able to uh, communicate that. We need to have some transparency in government. We need to work on that. The uh, budget process is something that is probably going to be talked about. Everybody is concerned about the budget. When we look at our uh, economy, uh, here we are. This is December the 8th. As far as I know, we still don't know what taxes we're going to be paying in January on the federal level. Have they done any, been any movement there? They've got an agreement, but they haven't passed it. They have an agreement, but they haven't passed it. And it's probably, they're probably going to pass something, but we don't know what it is. I think that's incredible that we stand here on the 8th of December and we don't know what our taxes are going to be in January. And uh, is that cause for concern up here, the city and our community? <coughs> yeah, kind of indirectly. <clears throat> One thing I want to suggest about the future <clears throat> is that our tax structure is probably going to change. You know, we've been dealing with the same federal tax code for many years now, and there's a lot of problems with it. And when that federal code changes, it may affect the way we do business here at this city. So that's, you know, when you talk about a community in motion, part of it is uh, being out there at the front and looking to see what's coming down the road and the taxes and things that might uh, influence 
how we attract businesses, and uh, how we might be structuring our own tax code. Talk about some of our important assets as a region. I think the first one that comes to my mind is uh, the water department. You know, we've been blessed with a, a supply of water that many communities, the envy of many communities. In fact, we're supplying the surrounding communities. Now, that's a big draw for industry. And it's particularly important to food processing plants. But we don't, I don't think we have it. Jody, we have a single food processing plant here. So we have an asset here that we can market that, that uh, hasn't, hasn't been marketed, apparently not successful. We have an airport, Stuart Powell Field, and uh, Mr. Powell has really done a great job with that airport. But I don't think we're done with that yet, and I don't think he does either. He's not ready to quit on it, and I want to help him. Because we have one runway that, actually it's two, you know, you go both ways, that's one, one ray or two. That's always confusing me. And what we really need is, uh, to really bring in the businesses, is uh, we need four that meet the standards. So I think we're, Lynn is, uh, is it 4,000 feet? The long run we 5,000. And, and the short one? North and north and south is about 2,700. We're hoping to expand that to 5,000. Yeah. We're going to have the first bill. Yeah. First. See, that's going to be important for Dan in terms of the industry that we're able to track here. Because a lot of these industries are flying in parts overnight that go on the assembly line the next day. So if we have that ability as a community, it's not only important to Danville, but if we extend that, but we have to go into Lincoln County. Yes. So now it's a regional. So, uh, you know, I look at this as, it's really a regional thing. So if I'm just looking in Danville, I can't get my airfield fixed. I can't get my airport. I gotta go to Garrett County, I gotta work with Garrett County. I have to go to the surrounding counties, and we need to team up so that when we go and knock on the people that have money at the state and federal level, that's just not just us, my time up. No, you just said, tell you when your time was up, but you keep going. Okay. <laughs> but is my 12 minutes, 10, 12 minutes up? That's, that, but it's purely your call. Well, we also have medical, we also have education. Those are, and those are probably some of the most important areas that I would cover here if I wanted, if, if I had the time to talk about a vision. But it's kind of hard to get it out in 20, 25 minutes. Uh, let me kind of close by letting you know what I anticipate doing as far as, you know, in the military we have the close battle, the intermediate battle, and the long range battle. And it's the same way in business. So when I take office, my close battle is going to be right there at City Hall on that commission things that we as a commission will be able to achieve and do as we look at uh, the immediate problems. I anticipate that battle will take about six months. So for about six months, I'm going to be 80% directed inside the building and about 20% outside. But after about six months, and it's, it doesn't just flip flop overnight, I want to reverse that and I want to change and I should have 80% of my attention focused regionally, internationally, outward. Uh, and 20% back inside the building. So that's, that's just me, what I anticipate at this moment. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, and that's workforce. And we're blessed, you know, a lot of times uh, I made a comment to Jody the other day, he had a very nice looking glossy and had four pictures on the front of him. Three of them were Center College. And Center College does a lot for our community. But if I'm looking, if I'm a plant looking for a place to locate, I'm gonna be much more interested in that technical school and that business college because those are the institutions that produce right out of my community assets that I can use right away inside the great paint. So we need to work on that. And also our school, our educational system. Now, those may not, uh, you may not uh, feel that's obvious a place for a mayor to be, but I hope to be involved in our schools. In fact, this commission, we've got a great asset on this commission. If you look at 
Mr. Atkins. I mean, he came out of the school system. So hopefully, and, and I'm sure he will, uh, he's going to help us in that area as a commission so that we can get a good co-op partnership and do what we can within the school. All right, I went over my 12 minutes, but I'd like to open up. I'd like to have questions uh, and to know what you all think, know what your concerns are. Paul. You addressed the water issue. We have a huge project in front of us. What do you anticipate that's going to unfold as far as funding? I think funding is a $64 question. You know, in the past, those funds were almost always, uh, in fact, we've got several water projects going now where up to 80% of the funds came from outside our community. And the big question is, on the $14 million water expansion that we need, will we be able to get 80% of those funds outside of our community? And I think that right now, with today's economy, that's in jeopardy. We've had on the table now for over two years that this project needs to be started by 2014 and uh, that $14 million, I believe that was in 2008 or $9. So I really don't see inflation as an issue right now, but it could be the way that uh, you know, we're going to have almost $900 uh, billion printed this next year by the Federal Reserve. $900 billion additional currency. Regulations, everybody's going after that money, so we need to be proactive. Yeah, now. so if that's that's an area we need to be jumping on both feet. You know, the, our water plan is an asset, it's kind of like the goose that lays the golden eggs because we've been bragging about our low water rates all this time when what we should have been doing is socking some aside for that out of our water income. And uh, I don't think we've done it, Paul. Have we, do we have any fund there for this established locally? There's not currently a capital fund for this expansion of water plant. So, so that's, that's going to be the issue is how to get started on that. But it's, it's going to be business number one getting that going. And, and I know Paul agrees with me on that. We've talked any, about that. Any bit. hopes of a city county merger? Well, that depends on you. <laughs> you know, I was asked a, a question during the campaign about the change in the form of government, and uh, I was elected under this form of government, and this is the form of government that I'm prepared to work with. If, uh, if the citizens want it, if there's a movement for any type of uh, change in the form of government, then I'm going to be a neutral party on that. Yes. Mr. Hunstead, you just recently commented that uh, for the next six months you're going to focus 80% of your attention on the doings inside the city hall. Uh, we've recently experienced a snafu considering a downtown event. Was this in line with what you were referring to, or could you elaborate any further? Well, tell me what that snafu was. Uh, that had to do with the Six World Shop Main Street event. But otherwise, could you explain a little further about what your attention will be yes. focused on City Hall? Uh, my number one worry, the thing that I lose sleep on, is our police department. We're down eight policemen. Two years ago, there was a hiring for each place. I've experienced the same type of snafu in the military in 19. 72 when they froze bringing new commissioned officers on active because they had a big reduction in end strength and what what may not be intuitively obvious there is that anytime you have an organization with military like skills where you can't hire that person off the street you have to have a pipeline when you interrupt that pipeline uh, your your losses are going to increase your gains are going to decrease. That's just the way it works. So we've gone from two, a shortage of two, and we now sit at eight. Now we've got some people in that pipeline, and, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not the expert on that, but
but I know from my background that this is a precarious situation for C to be in. Dan was at a crossroads. There is a lot of traffic through this town. I live on 4th Street and I hear the sirens. Uh, you can't go one hour without hearing a siren in this town. Uh, we have major drug operations that come through here. Uh, we're in the hard economic times. We've had to pull, or excuse me, the police department had to pull off investigators. Uh, right here is we're going into the burglar season. So uh, I'm concerned about the safety and the welfare of Danville, the citizens at home, the security of your homes, and the businesses. You had Chills recently robbed, uh, I think in a 10 days or 10 day span, we had four robberies, armed robberies, something like that. So uh, we have a dedicated police force, and we have, uh, there's a portion of those that are putting a lot of overtime. And uh, that's, a, that's a good, I mean, it's great we have that dedication, but we got to do something to change that. So one of you know my first actions will be with the commission, and, and we're going to come up and we're going to put together some type of a a recruiting program so that we can be successful in recruiting additional policemen. Right now they're going out. We actually have people, uh, policemen that are leaving the force to go to a sheriff's department. We can't compete salary-wise with Harrisburg. We can't bring in a policeman from another city and start him out at his level of experience that he left. So we have got to make changes in our police force. So an adjacent question to that would be, now that we, as of March the 2nd, passed law in order to have legal sales of alcohol, which tax revenue goes directly to the city for law enforcement. That's a great byproduct of that of that law. Hypothetically, if if someone started a movement two years from now to have a campaign to vote Danville Dry, play that forward as to how you think that would play out. What was your question? Uh, the question is if you've got a revenue stream coming in for law enforcement, and I totally agree with you beefing it up, we've been understaffed for too long. What's going to be your position on that? Because that's going to be a, a that's going to affect the revenue stream for law enforcement. I don't know that. Uh, <clears throat> Are you aware of the our police department? Did their budget go up? Had made that budget. I don't know, but it's got to go up. Well, uh, our city budget went up about a million dollars. It was about twenty six, twenty seven million. But I don't think the police park budget went up. The the areas primarily in all those areas, it's the hazardous duty retirement that is taking a, a lion share of those increases. Other than, other than that, uh, you know. It, has been fairly flat. As a duty uh, increased 2%. It's up about 35% of the salary. So that was an additional expense to the city. As well as, uh, I think the rest of the non hazard went up 2% as well. So they're about, it's at 18%. They're, they're 16, 16 and a half. Yeah. I think it's going to 18%. Those we'll go yeah, and I think the hazardous is like 33, and it's going to 35. <laughs> So let's say you've got an additional quarter of a million dollars coming in a year. And let's say that goes to law enforcement from alcohol sales. Well, as far as I know, that money goes into general revenue. Until somebody makes a budgetary decision and increases the police department budget, and it's not all about dollars. Part of it is uh, their, their human resource questions. Let me direct this to Paul. They just clarify this. My understanding is the, the tax from the sale of alcohol in this community has to go toward law enforcement. That's KRS. Is that correct? The KRS, the 
revenues go for alcohol <coughs> regulatory activities, some of which are alcohol, some of which are restrained. But that's still alcohol related. It's yes. still law enforcement. Yes. It, I, I, it, I may beg to differ. I'm not sure that can go into general fund. It can't go into a, a water situation. Is that correct? Uh, that, that money is uh, designated to go for regulatory activities with regard to alcohol. So, so you couldn't take that and spend it in the water department. Okay. So with that said, if it, if it can't go... Well, you, you, you haven't hired anybody in the regulatory department. We have one overworked person there by the name of Bridget who frequently right. is, receives uh, unkind words from the public. <laughs> Because she's, how many different jobs is Bridget doing now? Uh, she's codes enforcement, parking enforcement, uh, ABC, plus, plus some other duties that are attenuate to those. Well, maybe it's too early in, 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 your, in, your, in your tenure here, and that's fine, but there's, there's going to be a flow of money that's going to go into a silo somewhere in the bus, and I don't think it's going to be able to go just as a general fund expense item. That's, that's clearly my understanding. And so, um, well, let's look at law enforcement and some of the expenses. Right. We have an aged fleet of Crown Victorians. They have stopped production on them. Uh, those Crown Vicks are pretty inexpensive stock vehicles until you start putting lights, radio packages, uh, cage bars, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the past, all of that stuff was taken off the old crown and putting on the new crown bed. Well, uh, in the next purchase, it's not going to, I don't know what it is, and maybe Paul does, but it's not going to be a crown bed, and none of that stuff is going to work. So our police department in this city has a tremendous amount of other law enforcement expenses. And they're coming up, and it doesn't necessarily address recruiting. But if the tax revenue goes to pay for recruiting, goes to pay for new police cruisers, and two years from now there's a ballot that says we're, we want to test to see if the town can go dry. As mayor, where Mike, will that is your you? question really about the police department or whether I support alcohol sales? No, it, it, it's about it's about where you stand as mayor on a revenue item. That's purely where it stands. Because it's a revenue item. Revenues have to match expenses. So it really is a budget issue. And of course, Paul prepares the budget. The commission approves it. The primary fiduciary responsibility is going to be the commission. Correct. So I guess what we're getting at is we're going to have some hard budget years ahead of us. Because we have to make sure that we're addressing the right priority. And, and I've just told you that my number one priority right now is getting a trained, capable, fully resourced police department. That means there's going to be some tough choices. It would appear to the best interest of all to address the immediate problems and let two years take care of itself, Mike. Yeah. Other question. I see George. Can we go back to work? <laughs> We're done. I'm done. <laughs> Mr. Hudson, thank you again very, very much. Uh, Dave, I want to thank you again. If you think that um, this year public policy has been good, let me give you a little Christmas present. You ain't seen nothing yet. We've already started working on 2011. This room will be standing room only, and I fully expect that next year this partition is going to be out of the way as we're going to expand. But we're going to bring some folks here, um, and that's what we do. We you want a community in motion, we got a chamber in motion, and we're making some serious changes. I will tell you that we're gonna put the finishing touches this afternoon on what will be a fairly major uh, restructuring uh, with inside the chamber. Um, times change, you gotta change the structure. 
you got to make it more nimble you got to address today's needs that's what we're doing um, ah last and as a sign of our change how many people went to the chamber banquet last year show of hands about maybe half the room um, we have looked at that and said you know what it's time to change it up so we turn to our young people we turn to a group that's uh, very loosely assembled called the young professionals because they were the ones that said it ain't working and we said you know what you're right we're gonna throw you the football and we're gonna let the young people take this and do this on February 28th Jan January 28th excuse me and it's no longer going to be called the Chamber Banquet, it's going to be called the Chamber Celebration. Now it's going to be different. It's uncomfortable. I'm out on a limb. The Chamber's out on a limb. But you know what? You know the definition of insanity. When you keep doing the same thing over and over and you expect the results to be different? Well, we're not insane. We may fall flat on our face on the 28th of January, but hey, we're going to go down and we're going to have a good time doing it. And if that doesn't work, we'll change it up again. Again, I want to also uh, say 2011 is going to be great, thanks to Dave Weller. Uh, with that, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, safe, happy, healthy holiday.